what we're going to do is I'm going to do I'm going to do a brief introduction, um, and then pretty much we're going to open it up for questions. And uh, you know, if, whether you're an entrepreneur yourself or if you want to infuse a little entrepreneurial spirit into your your current jobs, we hope you enjoy this session. Um, one of our panelists could not make it. Uh, got them to rang was called into a client meeting right before this session. So we were talking about this beforehand. There's a lesson about entrepreneurship in there as well. You have to, clients always come first. So, uh, but we still do have two alums here. Both are MISM 2011 alums, Druville Sangby and Narayan Venkatesh are here. Uh, a little bit about Druville. He's the founder of Loginext. His, his company provides logistics and supply chain technology to enterprises across various industries. Since 2015, Loginex has grown to serve over 200 large clients in 50 countries, being supported by offices around the world. He's also raised over 100 million in funding from marquee investors and has been recognized by Forbes Entrepreneur and Deloitte as one of the fastest growing and most innovative entrepreneurs. Narayan Vakitesh is our other speaker today. He's the co-founder of Tilla, a company that is at the forefront of modernizing maritime crew management. I was watching some some videos of uh, Narayan beforehand. It's very interesting space that he's working in. So we can't wait to hear a little bit more about that. But with a diverse background spanning from tax fix, PwC and SAP, Narayan's venture into Tilla marks his commitment to innovating uh, shipping in that industry, innovating supply chain in the shipping industry. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna turn it over to Drewville who will give a much more, I didn't do him justice, but a much more, uh, uh, detailed introduction, and then we'll pass it over to Narayan, and then we'll open it up for questions. And, and we hope you, you came prepared with uh, some good things to learn, the good, the bad, and the ugly of entrepreneurship. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Drew Bill. Well, thank you so much, Ron. First of all, it's uh, uh, it, it it makes me feel really, uh, really proud, and and, and it's honors to, to be here uh, in front of all these, you know, um, great CMU alumni. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for showing up and showing your interest in learning more about my journey. Uh, as Ron rightly introduced, uh, I went to CMU and I'm a class of 2011 uh, at Heinz College in, uh, from the Masters of Information Systems Management program. Uh, that program was fairly life-changing for me. Uh, and Ron has kind of seen a very big part of it and has played a big part in that life-changing experience for me. Uh, my sister went to CMU as well in 2005. So that was my first reference point about, about CMU and what Heinz is. She had this exact same program. My brother-in-law went to Tepper uh, right after. So, so I was kind of familiar with, with what, what Carnegie Mellon has to offer. Uh, but I was fairly naive about these newer technologies uh, like AI and machine learning. They were largely buzzwords back then. Um, I was just attracted towards doing something in data. Uh, I was uh, I was decently an analytical or a or a, or a quant uh, savvy uh, you know young young guy, uh, so chose to do this program in CMU. Uh, I still remember participating in these uh, early entrepreneurial competitions like the Keith Block in Heinz, and that kind of gave me that exposure on what what it takes to even build a startup idea and what it takes to even think of uh, of a new company and a business model. So that education and that exposure was extremely valuable. In 2011, after graduation, I joined Deloitte, uh, which is one of the uh, advisory firms on tax and audit and a lot of other financial services, but also does a lot of tech consulting. Uh, so they had this tech technology advisory program, which they hired me for. When I joined Deloitte, my single life goal was, um, was to become a partner and the fastest partner at Deloitte, uh, because I was so much impressed by uh, by all these uh, managing directors and and the senior partners at Deloitte and their um, and, and their way of convincing customers and bringing technology to life uh, and solving complex problems for large organizations, so I was very impressed by them. At the same time, I had this had this uh, you know background, and some corner of my of my heart was talking about entrepreneurship, and I had this feeling that I want to start my own company at some point, but did not really have enough enough financial backing or maturity as, 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 as a professional to really take the plunge. In 2014, after three years of working at Deloitte, I started thinking about uh, and started getting more exposed to how these large organizations work. 
within that three to four years of experience in 2014, 15 timeframe, I had enough experience at Deloitte to understand that most of the large organizations and on and these Fortune 500 and Fortune 2000 companies, they look very shiny from outside and they 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 claim to do a lot of stuff in a much more organized way. But behind the scenes, there's a lot of constant hustle and chaos that goes, that, 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 that is a part of it. A lot of times information runs in a silo and then people operate in a silo. Um, and at that time, in the same time frame, there was this whole startup wave where Amazon and Ubers of the world were becoming large companies. I still remember in 2011, Amazon had filed its first profitable quarters in public markets. In 2014, Google Maps had started offering their B2B solutions because before that, Google Maps was just a consumer app and there were no APIs and whatsoever. Uh, I remember Uber had became a unicorn in 2014 and started operating outside the United States to become a truly global company. In 2015, Uber started doing shipping as well. So they started offering Uber Eats, Uber packages and whatnot. And with all this e-commerce ride hailing and tons of startups and you know cloud computing coming up, I noticed that most traditionally, you know, traditional large organizations like the Walmarts and Sears of the world or, or Giant Eagle kind of grocery chains in, in, in Pittsburgh region, right? So many such companies, they were still, they did not even have their e-commerce cart live. You know, you couldn't really place an order online. They were figuring out if we should go online or should we offer a three-day delivery service or a five-day delivery service and whatnot. So that's when I thought that if, if we could really offer a platform, a technology platform offered in a, in a SaaS model, which is software as a, sub, as a, as a service model, which is a subscription-based licensing, licensing of software. If we could offer that, uh, all these companies would, would love to use it. And especially none of these large companies had DNA to build software in-house. Uh, and even if they tried to do it, it would have cost them millions of dollars to build their own software. So if we could charge a few hundred thousand dollars per year in subscription fee for our platform, that could be a market opportunity. With that thought in mind in 2015, when I was 26 years old, I took the plunge. Uh, the first thing I remember, you know, being in the US, being an international student and, uh, and a professional on, a, on an H-1B visa, um, I realized that if you want to start your own company in the U.S., you first need to get the this visa sponsorship because you can't even be in the U.S. at that time. So I did not. I had about hundred thousand dollars of my savings, uh, had no visa status in U.S., uh, and the only country I could experiment with uh, limited financial resources was my own home country, India. So in 2015, I moved back to India. Uh, hired a you know hired a few engineers. Um, the cost of hiring was. Uh, significantly lower in India. It is still lower than if you compare to the US. Uh, but the talent quality was increasing, uh, which was exposed to this whole new way of building tech, uh, operating on cloud computing, spawning an AWS instance and getting getting an application running for customers to see. Uh, so I thought that that was very cool. I could I could I could kind of just reach out to my network and get about four or five folks to work for me. Uh, in 2015 to 2017, we built. Uh, an enterprise application, which was minimum viable product. So we had this tracking and routing modules, as we used to call it back then. Um, so I, I offered it to a few customers in India and in the US to try it out for free. Uh, invested my $100,000 of savings over those, those first 12 months. And at the same time, was fortunate enough to raise money from some of the you know initial seed funds from India and from the US, some, some interesting angels who were very helpful to back me. Uh, just with an idea and and some some MVP without having any paying customer base, so I I could raise about seven and a half million dollars in first twelve months. Um, and I think the CMU background and the pedigree is very very helpful in raising money. So that that was very helpful at that time. India was just at the cusp of this this revolution where Indian companies could really build scalable businesses for the first time in the history of India. Uh, so there was a lot of excitement in the investor community. Uh, so with that money, I could kind of build even mature product, could go to market globally. From 2017 till 2023, uh, until last year, we have grown from zero paying customers to more than 250 enterprises across the world using our software. Um, uh, we have a team of 250 people in India. We have, we have about 25 people in the US. Uh, we have some people in Dubai and Malaysia as well for our EMEA and APAC uh, go to market. Uh, we currently do 
uh, uh, you know, roughly around $50 million of annual revenue. Uh, we are highly profitable from a gross margin per perspective. We are also borderline net profitable. Uh, we have recently we have done our Series C round of investment. To, to, uh, together, we have raised about you know more than $100 million from marquee investors like Tiger Global, Steadview Capital, Alibaba, and a few other companies. Uh, and you know we've been very fortunate to do more right things than the wrong things. Have made tons of mistakes along the way. Uh, I remember almost you know like I remember crying out of you know, with tears in my eyes, pretty much every month in the first twelve months of journey, uh, and and regretted why did I even take the plunge and why did I even start the company in the first place. So, uh, but fortunately, all the decisions and the hard most of the decisions and the hard work you know I I did kind of went into the right direction, fall, fell into place. Uh, and 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 kind of you know uh, uh, bring this company to where we are today. Uh, so I would love to speak more about about what did not work for us versus what worked for us because there's enough stories and and content online available about my journey and Logitech's journey over the last seven eight years. Uh, but there's not much written about uh, you know what you know what went wrong. So I'm assuming you know all of you are uh, entrepreneurs are interested in knowing more about entrepreneurship. Uh, and I would love to kind of share as much as I can. Um, uh, so feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we would love to make it more interactive. Uh, over to you, Naran. Thanks, Rubel. Apologies, I was uh, facing a few difficulties with uh, just launching Zoom on my computer. Um, but I'm glad to join uh, this, uh, this session uh, and to speak to everybody. I'm just going to do a brief introduction again, same as Dhruvil. Also, maybe just share uh, my journey to how I became an entrepreneur. And uh, then as Dhruvil said, we can pick up on Q&A and then share what went well, what didn't go well. So uh, for those um, who don't know me, Narayan, um, I was also in CMU with the same batch as Dhruvil. Um, and as Dhruvil, I also come from India. Um, so it's been an interesting journey for myself. Um, so before joining CMU, I actually worked in India for four years, uh, five years, close to five years with SAP. So I already with a computer science background, I was working as a software engineer. I interestingly came to CMU with one purpose, <laughs> and I might have shared this with many folks uh, during my time at CMU, which was I wanted to be a consultant and I just wanted to join consulting. And for me, the, uh, the, the, the whole program, I tried to navigate it around how to get into consulting. And just as Dhruval joined Deloitte, I joined PwC after. But the, 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 the way I sort of navigated my own CMU journey was I really looked for courses that would really give me those key skills that I learned from others, other consultants that, that would be really valuable um, and that would let me shine. Um, so one of the courses that I definitely, if folks here, some of the students are still interested, um, Professor Erica Fuchs course on entrepreneurship uh, was amazing. I think it, I would highly recommend uh, learning under her if that course is still being offered. Um, that was one of the, I think the courses that really changed how I perceive, I think business, the world, uh, technology, entrepreneurship, so many, so many touch points in that course. Um, but after graduating, I joined PricewaterhouseCoopers um, and then worked with PwC in the US for a few years. Um, in my journey, uh, interestingly, uh, unlike Dhruvil, I didn't directly jump into entrepreneurship. Although across my time, even from, I think, bachelors, I was always curious to build something. And there were many attempts at building things, which I will save for later. Um, but even after graduating from CMU, I worked with PwC as a consultant in the US for many years. Then I moved to Europe and also worked in Europe with PwC and close to eight years of experience. So while Dhruval was already building uh, his startup and then already scaled it quite well, um, I was still with consulting with always this sort of itch in the background that I wanted to do something on my own. Within PwC, um, I when I worked in the US, I focused on airline industry. So it was very nice. So I worked for United Airlines, Delta, JetBlue, a few hospitality 
chains as well. So it was very nice to learn a lot about how, as Dhruval mentioned, businesses are run. So it was an eye opener. Um, it certainly allowed, consulting definitely allowed me as well to really gain um, solid business understanding and how big businesses are run. Uh, moving to Europe, I actually shifted to the same within consulting, a slightly different service line. So mergers and acquisitions. That was once again, a tremendous learning, I have to say, because I shifted from sort of an operational perspective of the business to how financial sort of a view of the business is, especially related to value of a business. How do you sell it? How do you assess it? Especially keeping technology in focus. So this was yet another shift for me. And I think combining both, um, this gave me, this sort of made this itch to do something on my own extremely strong. So right around COVID times, I decided finally to leave PwC. I didn't have anything along with me. So I just said, well, I have same as Druville. Um, let me use some of my savings and everything that I can do, let me try. Of course, I moved to Germany, so I'm currently based in Munich. Um, it was equally hard um, launching a startup when you're not a citizen of the country. So it was uh, quite an interesting journey. So for a year, I actually tried pitching my own ideas. It was quite difficult to get any traction. And un unlike India, which is home country for me as well, it's much harder to find this sort of community of engineers who might be willing to take that plunge. So it definitely took a bit of time. Um, and then eventually I joined TaxFix, uh, which has become a unicorn here in Germany. It focuses on filing taxes um, similar to H&R Block or uh, TurboTax. Um, and it was an amazing journey as well because I was leading the France sort of team like focused on the tax filing for France. That was my first sort of, let's say, plunge into the world of startups until then having worked in corporate um, and sort of taking that as, uh, let's say, a stepping stone. I eventually found my current calling, which for the past three years I've been working in. So my company, I founded along with a co-founder um, is Tilla. We're focused on maritime and we're really focused on helping the human resources um, division of maritime um, perform their duties much better. Maritime largely is paper and pen based. Um, so we're really digitizing this. Um, so this has been the journey for me for the past three years, I would say. Um, and my, again, the coming back to the entrepreneurial journey, um, the startup that I founded with my co-founder is actually backed by a venture studio. So unlike Dhruval, who shared about how he invested his own savings to really sort of uh, bootstrap everything. So my journey is, again, slight bit different. So I'm also looking to see, I'm sure there might be a lot of Q&A questions that I would be happy to share how this this sort of pathway would work as well. Um, but nevertheless, so it's been three years of really exciting times. And as Dhruval mentioned, I have already, since we we're early, I've also had my fair share of sitting down on a Saturday or a Sunday thinking, what have I done to myself? Um, long days, long nights, and it definitely keeps me very occupied and definitely eats into what would typically be personal time. Um, but as I would always share, it's been a deeply, deeply satisfying journey to be an entrepreneur, to do something, to create something of value where none exists, and to actually also have that value be appreciated by the market, by the customers, by the industry. Um, so it's an amazing journey. So maybe with that, Ron, I think I'll hand that back over to you and then we could field some questions and maybe pick up from there. Yeah, for sure. Let if you, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand um, and ask it, or you could put it in the chat and uh, the time is yours. I, just really briefly, I was asking Narayan, how he got into the, the maritime industry if he grew up on ships. And his response was when he came to Pittsburgh and was by, by the three rivers, that was the closest he had to, to uh, you know, living by water. So that was interesting. But yeah, I see some hands up. So uh, Georgette, we'll, we'll call on people and we'll go from there. Ah, uh, yeah. Wai Chang, do you have a question? Oh, yeah, uh, thanks for the wonderful speech. Um, so I'm um, the alumni, and I uh, guess I want to know as a like startup a founder, and uh, when you have ideas of giving up, you have some backup plan, stuff like that. What if your startup startup has a failure or something like that? 
I couldn't catch the whole question. If you could repeat that, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, when, when, when sometimes you feel that your startup may fail, do you, you, you think of some backup plan in, a, in advance? Uh, what, 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 did, what did you think of the backup plan you have? Understood, backup, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, got it, okay. Do you want to take that first? Yes, thank you. All right, I'll, I'll go first then. Um, okay. That's a great question, then. That's so... so, so <laughs> If I take a step back, right, and I look at my own journey, and I've helped a lot of founders uh, over the last eight years, and and you know, as as Logitech has grown, I literally get like one inbound on my LinkedIn, um, pretty much every week, where somebody from CME would you know would be wanting to start up, and they would say, you know, how do I take the plunge, right? Because I have a great idea, um, uh, and you know, I'm a little jittery because I want to, I don't want to quit my job yet. Uh, and I want to first build the product and then kind of launch it and then quit my job. Um, the reason I'm sharing this background to answer the backup question is that I strongly believe that if you if one wants to be an entrepreneur and if you want to take the plunge, uh, there is no looking back. So unfortunately, while a plan B or a backup plan uh, is something very natural thing to think about, um, the more you think about a backup plan, the more likely it is that you will go back to your backup plan. So in 2014, 15, I honestly, for, and, and of course, I also thought about backup plan because when you take the risk, uh, you know, you know, there are higher chances. It, it may not work out in the first 12 months, 24 months, and you may have to go back to your job. But I strongly, I remember at that time, my backup plan was to just kind of go back to US and and, and get the same job. And I, I, I made sure that I have like good relationship with my manager at Deloitte and partners at Deloitte. Uh, but I strongly feel, and, and correct me if the question, if, if I'm you know digressing from the question, but but I strongly believe that thinking less less about the backup plan and taking the plunge, as long as you as as long as it's a it's a calculated bet, uh, and there is a proper business plan uh, that you are following, I would recommend not thinking about Plan B too much. Um, and there are, and most often than not, once you become a founder or an entrepreneur. And once you start, end up doing it for two to three years, there are very less chances that you will actually go back to your, to to what you are doing, you know, or to your plan B. Uh, while it may be very tough, it's very addictive. Uh, and I have most entrepreneurs that I've met, whether they are successful at what they decided to do in the first place or not, they always want to continue to become a, to continue to stay and be an entrepreneur. So yeah, long story short, I think I would recommend not having a plan B. We, I did have a plan B, never went to that. I've never seen founders going to a plan B. Uh, a lot of things go wrong, but when you don't have a plan B, your focus will become making the plan A successful at any cost. And that's the mindset it takes uh, to become successful at, at entrepreneurship. Then I do. I, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more at all. And I think the only thing I could add to this is my own story. Um, as I shared, I quit PwC. So I quit my job and I really took the deep plunge and I didn't really have uh, much of a backup plan. And uh, of course I tried and tried and uh, the backup plan, of course, all of the trying came at a cost uh, of my savings when I realized that that was going too far. And that's, I think what sort of Dhruvil alluded to that you just have to have like some sort of a way to come back to your job. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Um, so I navigated myself to a job uh, that I shared with TaxFix, but I, of course I never stopped trying. And that eventually led me to come back into the startup world. Um, but I would definitely say um, I personally had so many ideas and up until I fully quit and said, I will do this, it never materialized. Um, so that would be absolutely my um, recommendation as well for anybody thinking about this. And just to kind of add to that one more, like one thing I miss sharing is, you know, all these, like, so there are, especially in CMU, there's so much talent and, and pretty much everybody who went to CMU, I know, they all have great ideas. Um, but I think entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is more about taking the risk. And I think most people want to build the MVP first, hire some people or contractors behind the scenes in parallel to their job and have first one or two customers or POCs or first few downloads of your app, Right things like that. And then they want to quit their job and do it uh, or want to raise some money and then they want to quit their job and do it. But, you know, 99.99% chances that if you don't quit the job first without a plan B, 
you will not be able to get your MVP out, have your first customer and your first investors uh, uh, as such. So I think that would be my advice to not uh, you know, kind of take the plunge first and then think about uh, uh, plan B, if at all. Yeah, that's very adventurous and very brave uh, personality that I want to learn about. Thanks for the process. That's very brilliant. Yeah, thanks and for the question. Herdig, do you have a question? Uh, yes, yes. So um, thank you for sharing your journeys pretty candidly. Um, and both of you have sort of come from a corporate uh uh, roll into starting your own businesses. So your opportunity cost is fairly high when you make that decision, uh, right? So what are some of the key tenets that you add or that you leaned into to sort of convince yourself that, hey, uh, this is why I want to go ahead and take the plunge given my opportunity cost? Uh, was like, what are some of the things that convinced you to do this given your high opportunity? I, I, I don't know, maybe I can, I can, I can just take a quick test about it. There's no right answer, first of all, right? Because everybody has the different motivations. But what I feel is you really need to be passionate about that, that problem that you're trying to solve. And this is a very cliche thing, by the way, but I'm sure you would have heard this like in multiple other podcasts or online, online advices. But most, especially first-time entrepreneurs, most first-time entrepreneurs start because they really are passionate about that one specific problem they think they can solve. It's not about a big market size. It's not about, I want to make a lot of money. Um, it, it, it's just that you are just, you, you, can, you cannot stop thinking about that problem that exists in the world and you want to just kind of commit yourself to solving it. Uh, why money cannot be a motivator? Because there are very, very high chances that for a good foreseeable future, you will not be making any money. There's literally zero cash flow. For first three years minimum, I've never seen any founder taking any cash home. Um, even if they're funded, not funded secondary. Maybe they're just taking like, you know, very small salary home or something like that. Um, and I feel the more you, you know, kind of focus on um, customer's problem versus like something cool that you want to build. Like for example, a lot of founders that these days I meet, they want to build something in AI. But that's not the right motivation because then if you want to build something in AI, you are not still passionate. You are you are married to a technology or a, or a temporary hype. Or two years ago, I met a lot of people who want to build something in crypto uh, or blockchain, right? But it's not really a problem that you're trying to solve, right? It's your, you, you, you see a hype, you see a lot of action in the market, you see funding happening, you see public markets going crazy about it. Uh, and that is like a very short-lived motivation. And that's when you start thinking about your opportunity cost because you are weighing your... Uh, you know your your current savings or your current lifestyle uh, with with what you're gonna get in near future with with your ex, you know with your with your startup. But more often than not, what really ends up happening is that it it that that idea requires uh, you know it grills you really hard, and then you go through all sort of problems, including finding the best people, retaining them, fundraising, getting customers in place, getting the cash flow running. And once you have all these things in place, you chase profitability, and uh, you know, and, and and then if even if you get everything, you most often not end up compromising your personal life. You know, you can't, you don't have time for your family and friends. So there's so much at play. If you're not truly crazy about solving something, you will always eva evaluate with your past or your or your current state, and you will never take the plan. So, long story short, I would recommend if you if you really have something you feel passionate about in terms of solving for customers. That's the only way to really take a plunge. If not, if there's anything as money or a technology or it's a cool thing to do, it will most likely uh, you know come back to your and you will feel really bad about leaving your current state and lifestyle and 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 your salary or whatever that might be. Yeah, I could I again, this is is exactly how I feel as well. And if anything I could stress here, it would be, I think, as Ruval said, the solving piece of it. I think you have to have this sort of almost like an irritation about the way something is being done in the world today. Like you would look at it and you go, this cannot be, this has to change. And I have a smart idea. And I think this will improve X, Y, why the status quo doesn't work. And that should sort of drive you every single day. Like you feel very annoyed about it and you have to say, okay, that's it. Like I will be the one 
who will pick this up and I will gear towards solving this problem. Um, and then this is what I will do. And truly the motivation has to be the problem. Um, so you want to solve the problem, not um, say married to a technology that solves the, so I'm going to solve this with X or it's not the fact because you learn a lot along the journey. Maybe you don't have perfect information over time. You will understand the problem better you get the nuances of the problem. But I think the key is that you are driving towards solving this. So this has to be the driving force. And then that sort of, um, I think, makes all the questions about opportunity cost, what you are keeping aside, what you're losing, like personal time and so on. Uh, it sort of puts everything back into a better perspective. And you would also be able to handle that much better because every time you do lose some personal time, but you're focused on your entrepreneurial journey, you do know why you are doing that trade-off. And you know that it's because you're passionate enough to solve this problem. So you're willing to make that trade-off. Otherwise, you might start to lose focus. And I think this opportunity cost question starts to become this, let's say, impediment in your thought process. So. Got it, got it. Appreciate it. And thank you for sharing that framing. Pretty useful. Thanks as well. Punya, do you have a question? Yes, I do. So, uh, so thank you. This has been really interesting. I think somebody just messaged asking both of you to briefly describe your business as well as, um, you know, who your competitors are. And also, I I'd love for you to answer that before um, answering my question. But, you know, um, as a tag on to what uh, th this previous question, what I did want to ask is, um, Dhruval, you mentioned that you put in $100,000 roughly, give or take, of your savings into creating kind of like the MVP. Um, you know, I, just curious sort of like what your conviction was to to put your savings behind that and how you tested it and, and what kind of like, how did you establish milestones to say, hey, you know, if this doesn't work out, then I'm going to, you know, either try something else or like, pivot or whatever the case is. Um, and I think, Narayan, for you, my question is, you said you you tried a couple of different startups and you, um, and then you went back to work for, um, for the Stacks startup before you again, like attempted your own company. Um, so again, like when you, when you try these other different ideas, um, what were your decision points to say, you know, whether something was working or not? Like, I, I guess it's product market fit, but just, you know, if you can expand on that a little bit more. Sure. Um, happy to, first? Yeah, happy to go first. Um, maybe right. to pick on, pick on this uh, earlier question on uh, what we're doing, what we're solving. I'll try to keep it brief, not to make this into, let's say, a pitch in, in itself, because I think the value of this alumni session would be more on answering, I think, the 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 type of questions that we've been asked in the past. Um, so um, as I mentioned, uh, my startup Tilla, we're focused on maritime. Uh, in maritime, uh, there's a special responsibility for the human resources department. Uh, the seafarers are contract employees and uh, the vessels constantly move. They're in motion all over the ocean, anywhere in the world. So once their contract ends, the shipping companies have the responsibility to move the seafarers back home and also bring somebody to replace them. And this job is done painfully with paper, pen, telephone, think everything manual 30 years back, nothing has changed. Um, this is where we play. We're solving this with a software as a service, which is a digital tool that helps these human resources staff members to make this process much easier, more digitized. Of course, that's where our starting point is. Um, we're, we're building tons of automation, artificial intelligence. Um, so it really makes this very much data-driven and very modern, if anything. That's that's the one thing, like, I mean, paper pen versus something digital. So that's, where, um, that's what we're solving. We don't have many competitors in the market at the moment. We are fairly early entrants. So it's a blue ocean for us at the moment, which is a luxury for startups. It's not usually the case. Um, but again, maritime is less focused. It's not so sexy of a industry that, again, as well as supply chain, it's not that much that people focus. Also B2B, so largely B2C, everybody would like to make the next big social media app. So I think that's where uh, the idea that there are not too many competitors in this space. 
Um, I mean, I will leave that for what we do as Tilla. And coming back to this um, question about sort of how I navigated that, I I think honestly there, uh, as as we said, I think I took the plunge and I had a rough idea about how long I could sort of persist without having a job, um, and could sort of use my savings to test new ideas, do certain things. Um, and I did that. And uh, being here in Germany, it was harder to sort of, let's say, as I mentioned, get a team of engineers or even contractors, let's say any of those types of setup. So my journey was largely to get that initial funding, to get that angel funding. So a lot of my ideas that I tested were in different sectors. I tested this with some of the angel network here in Germany. Um, it took a lot of time. Maybe also COVID uh, definitely played a big role here. So it was close to, I would say, eight months or so that I tried uh, pushing my ideas, uh, before which I realized, well, this might be burning too much cash uh, in my savings. So maybe I will look back uh, to finding something that sort of gives me an income stream for the time being while I continue conversations. I think I was lucky enough because I would have um, worked for a bit. I would have quit and then tried this again. But thankfully, I managed to continue to be deeply connected to the Berlin startup ecosystem. I managed to find conversations with like-minded individuals, and that's how I met my co-founder. Um, so I would definitely say I was lucky. But otherwise, I completely quit. And the only thing that was um, that I had in focus was how long can I go without an income stream? That was sort of the idea, a rough idea that I had. Um, yeah, maybe with that, Dhruv, I'll let I'll hand it over. And I'm 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 very um uh, very glad Naran, that I got to know more about your journey as well. It's been <laughs> it's been a while since we connected deeply on on exchanging notes. So so very glad to be part of it. First question uh, first is uh, what does Loginex do? Loginex helps the uh, enterprises which are in retail or e-commerce space deliver to their customers cheaper, faster, and better. Basically. In today's world, every anything being sold um, or serviced online has to be done in a in a same day or next day kind of a manner, right? For example, if if like Amazon Prime used to be a differentiator of Amazon five years ago, seven years ago, now most delivery companies for across more most category of goods, uh, each customer across the world can get to their home in in twenty four to forty eight hours max. If a company is promising a delivery window of three day or four day, customer would most likely not even place the order in the first place. Um, and that kind of creates a need to have high density transportation need in last mile, as we call it, which is basically home deliveries done or business deliveries done in last mile in a very high frequency and high density manner. Uh, and the, the and the further pressure you put onto timelines, that means some some of the companies are offering a ten minute delivery, thirty minute delivery, two hour delivery windows. That makes that problem even more complex, and complex enough for humans to not be able to solve it manually. That means you can't find the driver manually, you can't dispatch manually, you can't allow your customers to track that manually. It all has to be automated, and Loginex as a platform enables its customers, which are these companies in this e-commerce or retail space, uh, to do that order scheduling, dispatching, routing, tracking, driver, uh, uh, you know, fulfillment, all of that piece online on a single platform. Uh, our competition, we have about, when we started, we had only a couple of companies in the world doing it. Um, uh, and now we have more than 10 competition across the world. Uh, one of them is bigger than us. So we are number two player globally. And eight of them are significantly smaller than uh, you know than us in size, but we see this as a large enough market where at least two or three large companies will emerge over the next five years or so. So that's something that we are uh, you know we are focusing on right now. Uh, and our key differentiator that we, we our differentiator is that we we are the only platform which kind of enables end to end automation um, of entire workflow. It's a very complex and comprehensive workflow because we offer you know we we offer a platform to any category of goods, any customer, any region across the world. We have customers across the world, about one third coming from uh, from rest of the world, two third coming from the North American market. But but yeah, that's our differentiator where we are like much more comprehensive tool than anybody else. 
um, coming to the, you know, I hope that kind of helps the person who, who asked the question. Punya, uh, to answer your question, your question was, um, you know, how did I plan to, plan to invest this hundred thousand dollars of my initial savings, and how how did I plan to understand, you know, on how 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 long it should last? So there's no, first of all, there's no right or wrong answer here. And this is like a seven year old story, right? So today the numbers may have maybe different, maybe double than what one may have required seven years ago. But usually the rule of thumb is, is that a founder should plan a 12 to 18 month of runway when you start the company. So if you see that, you know, it, it's gonna, and, and the runway means that you should be able to start generating revenue by then. So that you can have some more incoming cash flow, which you can further invest into your business and kind of grow it from there. Or you should be able to raise some money in first 18 months uh, from a seed investor, angel investors, and and or, or, a, or a micro VC fund and whatnot. But for that first 12 to 18 months is what you need to plan as a business plan, financial plan, in terms of how much money it should take. If you need four engineers, two sales guys, uh, one marketer, like a seven uh, people team plus you have to pay, pay yourself a little bit of you know cash flow to sustain your basic living uh, so kind of plan that kind of a budget i have seen usually that budget comes down to be about between 100000 to 250k roughly in the us could be slightly lower in the other parts of the world but that's uh, again a rough range i have seen across most companies and that's why there are a lot of pre seed funds these days which would fund the idea itself or an incubation centers uh, which would fund the idea and then give you a grant or a or a you know uh, or, or, a, or a safe note or a convertible note based on investment, which is like a small 125k, 250k kind of amount, which would get you off the ground for first this 12 month of runway until you figure out a revenue engine or you raise more money from a institutional investor uh, to kind of help you scale further from that point onwards. Also, another part of the question was at what time does a founder know? It's not working out or you should pivot. I think for me, I feel one should give at least 1,000 day, days to, to conclude whether it's working or not. Like a lot of founders I've seen, they try for 12 to 18 months and they, get a, they run out of patience and they pivot. I think it's too, I mean, of course, you should keep enhancing and iterating your ideas, but pivoting means like just repositioning, changing the product, changing direction. That should not happen in 12 to 18 months because some things just take time. For example, especially in B2B, the sales cycles are long enough where your customer, no matter how amazing the product that you may have or how amazing of a pitch that you may have or an amazing founder you may be to work with, they would still not, they would take six to eight months to evaluate your platform, right? Before they can start paying you. So that cycle has to be considered. Similar is the case for consumer tech as well, where you need to have a critical mass of customers for you to kind of get to that threshold where you start you know, being talked about and you have inbound downloads happening. So I think that's, for me, it's a thousand day rule. So I recommend founders not to take like hard calls before thousand days. Uh, and I think for me, five years is like the super max. If things are not working for five years where you don't have sufficient revenue uh, or, a, or a product market fit, as they call it, uh, right? If you don't have that for five years, I think it's wise to drop that idea, do something else or go back to your jobs. Because I've seen founders who kind of go beyond five, five years and they really, you know, stress them out too much because then it's too much of a personal toll take it you know toll it takes um for yourself for your families and your cash flows and whatnot i think that's like i would say five years would be my hard stop but there's no right or wrong and there's no hard rules there are always exceptional stories around you know beyond these rules as well uh but yeah i hope that kind of answers your question thank you both that was really helpful and i really appreciate that thank you thank you for sharing Hey, this is Yaji. I want to ask some questions. At first, I want to really applaud the two speakers for your courage and passion for taking the plunge because myself as an international student coming to Carnegie Mellon on a visa, my first priority was to secure my green card before thinking about entrepreneurship. Um, but now I cannot stop thinking about it. Uh, my question is to you, uh, do you both are like, how do you size and pressure test your ideas? Because I have a couple of ideas and sometimes the more market research I do, the more I find, oh, other people are already working on it. Uh, do you like, how do you prioritize, you know, your ideas and uh, do you just, you know, try to be your competitors or you try to pivot to other areas? That's the first question. 
And the second question is on the HR side. Like if you're finding co-founders and like-minded people, do you, are they also like quitting their job because of the same passion or you have to hire them as your employee? And, you know, how did you get started with, with the HR side? And especially if those area you need is not your expertise. Uh, Good question. Uh, Naran, you want to go first? Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, the first one's interesting. Um, this is something that I guess like I've asked myself and I'm sure every entrepreneur before and after will also ask themselves, my idea is already being worked on by somebody else in the market. <clears throat> I see this um, and I don't know if that's a reason to stop um, your, your idea. Uh, the... The problem that you have identified is there and the, the weight or the gravity comes from the solution that you offer. Um, just because a single company or a couple of companies may be offering a solution in the market or are working on that very same problem does not mean that you stop working on the problem. Um, I would really say to focus on the solution that you want to bring and that's where the differentiator parts come from. And there's many other ways to create differentiation as well um, around what you, how you solve that problem for the industry or, um, or that particular problem space. Um, so I would say this is something that you can keep in focus um, while you're thinking about the startup. So there's uh, certainly no rule or it's not, it's not a strict, um, let's say, think that you have to drop your focus on the particular problem space just because others are trying to solve that. If anything, it only validates that the problem space exists. So um, maybe that's my sort of short answer um, for the first question. Maybe I'll hand it over to you, Dhruval, like to cover the first question and not make my answer too long. <laughs> well, sure. I think fully agree with you, first of all. Um, and just to add to that, I think one thing to also keep in mind that you will never feel comfortable uh, and you will never feel comfortable with your idea and you will never feel that your idea is good enough or your solution is good enough before you take the plunge. So you need to be comfortable accepting that there is no way to kind of make it a fully ready idea or a fully ready solution. It's an endless journey. Like even today we have like 100 more thoughts in terms of feeling like, you know, we can do better for customers and there's always some customer feedback coming in. Uh, and that's a feedback loop that you will perpetually be in. Um, so I would recommend don't try to like further hash out your ideas. And if you have two of them, I think the as, as Narayan said also, the easiest one is to see if, if you have a few customers who are willing to use it on a recurring basis or willing to pay for it. I think these are the kind of two key validations. And and I think the third would be, uh, which is not even a like a criteria as such, but make sure that you don't go to, you know, people who already know you. I think most early first time founders, their first validation audience is their friends and family. And that's mm -hmm. a big, big problem in my opinion, right? Because then no matter how much you feel they are being direct to you, they will not tell you the reality. So force yourself to talk to customers that you have no connection with. They are not via references. Somehow try to get to them. Uh, they will give you as objective feedback as you can get. And mm -hmm. if and if you can get such few customers, uh, maybe if it's B2B, maybe two or three, uh, may not pay you a lot. May you pay, might be paying you very little bit or maybe willing to pay you after you fully build a solution, but they are showing that willingness to pay. Or if you have an MVP build out, if they, if they feel that, uh, you know, if, if if they are open to using it every day, every week, I think that's a good validation. So recurring user base or paying user base in a very small manner, like doesn't have to be some large user base or large numbers, even small numbers. Uh, and such user base, which is not your friends and family, uh, I think that's your, that whichever out of your ideas is kind of leaning more towards Towards, towards these criteria, I think that's the that's the idea you should kind of double down yeah, on. Yeah, thank you. I think that makes perfect sense, letting the market to kind of validate. Yeah, absolutely. And the second question, uh, Dara, you want to go on the second question first? Um, sure. What was, okay. um, could, you, could you just share the second question again? Sure. Like in terms of HR side, how do you hire right people and find the right founders? Because I have, you know, I've worked with 
a few folks like me, fully employees to work on a, on a startup, they all have their full-time job and nobody is really fully invested in this and it's very slow. Uh, if say one of us takes the plunge and like, but you can't find an, another co-founder who also quit their job, like, do you hire them as your employees? How do you get started? Yeah, the it's it's actually difficult to find a co-founder. Um, and I won't try to maybe sugarcoat this. Um, it, it might work, it might not work. I think it's really all around how much you connect with your co-founder. And I would honestly say the thing that would help the most is to really have a lot of conversation with them. You need to get to know this person extremely well. They are your partners in a pretty difficult journey as you're building a company. Um, and you need to really, really know them well. You need to know each other well. You need to trust each other. Um, so building all of that takes a lot of effort and time. And I think the best way to understand uh, is, is spend the time um, converse with each other. And I think this is something that I did with my co-founder. We had a lot of conversations before we found each other to be the right sort of partner for um, sort of tackling this problem together. So this is something that I would say is the need. Um, you won't be able to short circuit this at all. Uh, there are, of course, um, some premier venture capitals have also put out some founder questionnaires that you could use. Um, I would say those are sort of let's say guiding sort of questions that you could ask them, you could discuss amongst each other. Uh, and But the part that works the best is when both um, or folks are honest with each other. So this is one of the trust building exercises that you really, really need to do. Um, the second part, which is to hire them if they're not sort of fully invested in, in the idea. I'm not very sure if that's a great sort of an approach. I've never heard this or come across this before um, to hire a co-founder because I think, I mean, this is more of a question of incentives um, as well because there's certain level of incentive to solve the problem, but there are of course other sort of forces at play to keep founders sort of, let's say gravitated towards this sort of solving the problem, building the company and so on. So I don't know if hiring might work the best. You might be better off hiring an employee with ESOPs yeah. or other options. Um, yeah, if you're hiring, would... they, become, they become your employee and the incentive is completely different. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, if you hire an employee, then the incentive structures are different. The motivations may be different. Uh, I think the there's dynamics that change. I think you have to be cognizant of that. If you do want to approach this idea, um, you have to be cognizant that they're not, let's say, an equal co-founder with incentives, with shares and other things that are so well aligned that, you know, you can depend on them for the next, let's say, as Dhruvil mentioned, for the five-year time frame or three to five-year time frame when you can really scale that startup and start to see traction and success in the market. So, um, so that would be uh, at least my few thoughts on this. No, I just double down on that. I think I have the exact same thoughts. I'll not take it long. I, have, I know we have this, just one minute on the scheduled call and we have one more question. So we'll, we'll try our best. But co-founders are not hired for sure. Um, please, it, it, if somebody who's not does not have enough skin in the game and, and commits to you verbally and feels very promising, looks very promising, still avoid. Um, I would recommend the incentive structure has to be extremely, extremely aligned with the founder. Ideally, I would recommend have a 50-50% partnership. If you don't see yourself getting into that relationship because you already have been on this bandwagon for a long time or sufficiently long time where you don't see anybody else having equal equity, then you should hire senior folks and give them like, I don't know, VP, CXO kind of titles to begin with. That's also fine with ESOPs uh, on stock options, which are roughly in the tune of like 2 to 10% of the equity of sorts. Uh, but that's the max. Like either, I think I've usually seen where it kind of becomes a tr tricky situation where a founder brings in co-founder after one year in the journey uh, with 30% equity. You will feel you have paid too much and that person will always keep feeling they are paid lesser than you. Uh, you know, Even if your salaries are same, the authority is same, the freedom is same, titles are same, but the 70-30 the split is actually a bad split in my opinion. Either go with 50-50 or go with like 90-10. 
I think that's just my view. I could be wrong. There's no right answer here. Uh, but yeah, co-founders are not hired. You have to kind of really, it's like, it's, as, as they say, it's very similar like a marriage. You have to date. You have to date hard <laughs> and long enough to find <laughs> soulmate. And if it doesn't work out, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it can really lead to a pretty bad situation for the company. Even a functional Thank company so can go dysfunctional because of co-founder um, issues. Of, of, I don't know if we were, thank you so much, but if we still have a little bit of time, like how do you hire great talent? Like if that's not in your area of expertise. It, it, that's, I have a very long answer on that one. So we'll hopefully, we'll, we'll have to table that one, unfortunately. You know, happy to speak to you offline. You can reach out okay. to both of us on LinkinedIn. We are very active, both of us. I know. Will do, thank you. Uh, happy to speak offline on this. We we are at time. So we are going to wrap it up. There were a couple questions we didn't get to. I'll share those with uh, Drewville and Ryan and uh, offline, and maybe you can answer then. Um, I do want to uh, thank you so much for your time. This This has been a great conversation. We could probably talk for another hour. Drewville, I know we talked about maybe having a series of these. So uh, maybe we'll get to the, um, the the things that made you cry in those first few, you know, the, the bumps <laughs> on the road. We could probably have a whole session around that. But for now, I just want to thank you again for taking the time out. I want to thank all of our alums who were able to, to tune in. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the, uh, the next uh, event. One last thing, we will be sending the recording out along with Drewville and Orion's contact information. So be on the lookout. The video may not be up in time, but just keep checking back. We'll get the video posted on our website as soon as possible. And with that, I wish you a good afternoon. Thanks for having us, Ron and Georgia. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Wish you a good day.